Could you explain PTS? Yeah, sure. So PTS is, a, is an acronym for um, potential trouble source. And what that basically means is a person is potentially a trouble source if they're connected to an individual who is actively antagonizing, harming, or suppressing um, their life. And when you're connected to somebody like that, you become what the church refers to as PTS, or somebody who is potentially a trouble source. So this is like a huge item in Scientology. When everybody's PTS. We've got to find PTS. And that, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like this medieval wild goose chase for like, you know, um, people who are speaking out against the Catholic Church. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's totally crazy. And it's just kind of like, and it's getting to the point now, it's, it's, it got to the point when I was there where it's like, you know, being PTS was like being like a, being like a leper. You know what I mean? It, it, it was like kind of like this, this crazy... Um, this crazy kind of association that it would be like, oh my God, PTS, oh my God, you know what I mean? And I think that's um, really interesting, you know, because you're, you're allegedly or supposedly engaging this philosophy that's supposed to totally free you from all these um, situations and, and experiences and relationships that are supposed to kind of like unleash, you know, your potential as a human being. And here everyone is, the whole organization, you know, just horrified of this possibility that you could be connected to somebody who's antagonistic. And one of the things that's so interesting, I think, too, is when they try to have you find the person who's antagonizing you, they always, it, it's, this is really interesting, is that they always try to, like, you don't know who it is. You know what I mean? It's like, like, for me, it's like, if somebody's antagonizing my life, it's pretty obvious. You know what I mean? I know they're doing it to me. But they try to make it like this secret thing where, like, you, they might be doing it to you in a way you don't know what's happening. So you really have to like find. So it makes you like churn these mental wheels incessantly. I mean, I, I was to the point where I was like, is my, mother, is my mother doing this to me? Is my father doing this to me? And my, my parents have been nothing but supportive of me my, my whole life and everything I've done. And I was to the point where I was actually considering the fact that they were like these evil people my whole life and I didn't know they were. You know what I mean? So they have this amazing ability to get you to consider that there are people in your life that have never hurt you are actually secret, kind of like secretly um, plotting your destruction. It's interesting. Yeah. Conversely, the only people you can trust are them. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely an us first them mentality once you get into the the organization, and I think that's that's a really sad thing because, you know, in the, I mean, you know, we live in the information age. I mean, we we live in a in, in a in like the postmodern world where information is everywhere. It's free, and it's changing. You know what I mean? So here you have this philosophy that's stuck in the 1960s. It's not changing because, and I don't even know if Hubbard himself, I actually think Hubbard himself would want it to evolve, you know, but I think the organization has put any stop on any like development of the technology, any new kind of philosophical streams to inject into the philosophy, and they're stuck. And in this day and age, that is like the opposite of what's happening on planet Earth. I mean, it's really exciting to be alive on planet Earth. There's so many things happening in terms of technology, spirituality. All these different things are growing and changing at such a rapid rate with the Internet. And here you have Scientology that's just stuck in 1962. And we know the answers, and we're not changing, and this is how it is. And you see why their numbers are declining, and you see why people are leaving, and you see why, and not only that, but you have this terrible abuse that the organization is engaging on on a daily basis, human rights, financial, all these different um, actions that they're taking on that are legitimate abuse of human beings, coupled with their totally backwards philosophy. It's no wonder why it's, it's, it's a dying organization. You talk about the information age. When you're there at the Fort Harrison, yeah. are you able to hop on the net and yeah. look at the outside world? Yeah, you, you are, but you know, you're not allowed to hop on the net to look on anything about Scientology, you know what I mean? But you are, yeah, there's internets there that you can, you can look on. The, the actual staff members can't, but public are fine. I mean, there's free Wi-Fi and everything like that in the hotel. When I was down there, um, there was an article on the Drudge Report. I, I was on the Drudge Report one day reading something, and there was an article about Scientology. I forget what it was, but it was something, and I clicked on it, and I said to somebody, oh, there was said this really horrible thing about Scientology on the Internet. I go, what, what, what were you reading that for? I said, it was on the front page of the Drudge Report. I was reading the Drudge Report. And um, I might even, I don't know what it was, it was CNN or something like that. But um, yeah, so I got in trouble for that. Yeah, they just asked, why did you click on it? What did it say? Did you tell anybody? Did you talk about it with anybody? Stuff like that. So it was basically like a, a very 
subtle inquisition of, of, of the actual, and for me it wasn't even a big deal because at that point I was still, you know, willing to trust the organization and believe that um, what I read was false and, and, and um, yeah, so they, they, by their own actions, pushed me further away. Like for me, I read it, I didn't hide it, I said to them, I read it, you know? And then there was this kind of like, you know, inquisition into my life, and then I was like, whoa, what the, <laughs> what's going on right now? And then from that, that experience made me realize that, you know, whatever. So the quality of auditing, you said, was, was troubling at FLAG. How did it, how was it different from what you had in Boston? I think the main difference was just the care of the people. You know what I mean? And I think that's what auditing or any therapeutic process is. It's you have two people, one person who's, uh, you know, the practitioner or the psychologist or the auditor, and the per other person who's the, who's the student or the, or the uh, patient or the preclear. And I think in any situation, when the person who's engaging in the therapeutic act has care and respect and honors the process, then good things happen, no matter what it is, auditing or not auditing. Um, so I think in Boston, there, I found that there was, a gen, there was a genuine care for me processing, doing the, the, the actions in Scientology, whereas at FLAG, there was, there was very little care. And every time I walked out of the auditing room, there was three people looking for me. One to have me join the Sea Org, one to have me donate money to the IAS, maybe four, one to have me donate money to Superpower, one to have me donate money to planetary dissemination, one to have me donate money to ideal orgs, one to have me buy the bridge. So there was, at, at any given time, there was one of six people looking for me the moment I walked out. And it's really interesting because they coordinate it. You know what I mean? So like, for instance, the IAS, um, they'll call the person who's in charge of the auditor and say, hey, is, is Joe Smith out of session yet? And they'll look and say, oh, he'll be out in 10 minutes. All right, good, I'll go meet him. So they had this whole thing kind of worked out where the people are like waiting for people. And it's actually to the point where they know if a session went good or not. You know, so it's like they know if somebody had a really good session and they you know, maybe had some kind of experience that could be conceived like a kind of a spiritual epiphany or some kind of awakening, that this would be a good time to get money from them. You know what I mean? So they have this whole thing worked out, which is just like, yeah, it's sickening. You know what I mean? It's beyond sickening. Would they know, know that before you actually left the auditing room? Yeah, I found that afterwards, yeah. Not before they left the auditing room, but they would talk to the aud there, there would be some kind of dialogue between what's called the tech services and the IAS people. So the tech services would be the people that coordinate with the auditor to get the preclearance session. And they would know the situation just based upon what the preclear looks like or what they're talking about. And they could go back, oh, he looks really happy. You should, you should go get some money. You know, kind of like that. But well, they wouldn't necessarily know details of your auditing session. No, no, no. They wouldn't, know, they wouldn't know any details other than the fact that Joe Smith just walked out of the auditing session and he's beaming. And he has this big smile on his face and he's talking to everybody and, you know, things look really good for Joe Smith. You should go talk to him. Yeah, there would be no details. But there, but there would be kind of a perception of him as a human being and, and what he... I mean, auditing is actually quite powerful when it's done correctly. And there's no question in my mind that that even though I don't think it's necessarily the best therapeutic approach, um, it's, it's definitely a beautiful way to, for people to um, potentially, you know, engage in some kind of healing practice. And there's no question that it can have these big, huge kind of like effects where people can walk out of a room and go, whoa, I feel incredibly alive right now. I feel incredibly happy right now, something like that. So anybody could see that effect on a person and run back and say, hey, Joe Smith's looking pretty good right now. You might want to go talk to him and see if he wants to donate some money. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's truly, truly um, sickening the way they manipulate that situation. The person who signed me up for services at Flag was a guy named Charlie Bills, who apparently is like this old kind of like, you know, war veteran of Scientology who's been around for a long time. And it's kind of funny because he would say to me, literally, before I went there, don't give anyone any money. You know what I mean? He would actually say this in those direct words. Don't give anyone any money. Um, so it's interesting because the first day I got there, I was supposed to get picked up by um, the flag kind of like hotel bus, the Port Harrison bus. So I get off the plane, and I, had a, I remember I had, a, I had a connection in Charlotte that day. It was Boston, Charlotte, Tampa. And I got off the plane, and I go down and get my bags. And I'm waiting in line to get my bags, and all of a sudden someone says, hey, Brian, 
and I turn around and it's like this 16 year old girl, 17 year old girl. And um, I was just like, yeah. And she was like, hey, I'm here to pick you up. And I'm like, you're here to pick me up? I'm like, Can you, do you have a license? You know, kind of kidding around. Um, and then some other older guy she was with. And it was interesting, she was his boss, which I found really fascinating. She was like a 16 year old girl and he was like a 50 year old man and she was his boss, um, which is actually really common in Scientology. Um, which, which actually is, is kind of cool, you know what I mean? Which is kind of interesting that they don't pay attention to. What's the rationale behind that? Um, the rationale, I should say that I don't think that's necessarily cool, but I think the fact that they overdo it, but the fact that like age and sex never played a role in Hubbard's thinking of who should be responsible in an organization, which I actually think was actually somewhat forward thinking. Now, I don't mean kids, but I mean like if there's a 20-year-old woman who's as good as a... 50 year old guy, Hubbard would say 20 year old woman is going to do it because she's better. You know what I mean? And I, I thought that was somewhat admirable of him in terms of his ability to see through cultural and, and sexual and social restrictions that were really in place in the 60s that he started right through that. But, but anyway, the, the point being is that this, this young woman and this, and this guy um, come to pick me up and um, they are from the Superpower Project. And they knew I was coming, and they knew I was coming to do my L's. So they, they say, we're here to pick you up and give you a ride. And I say, okay, fine. So we get in the car, and the whole car ride from Tampa to Clearwater, which is about a 25-minute drive, it's incessant, nonstop um, badgering for money for the Superpower Project. And I get this full rundown of what it is. And it's interesting. It's 2012 now, this is 2009. It was going to be open in three months, and they needed the money. It's, 2000, it's three years later. It's not open. You know what I mean? Which I find kind of interesting. And they were using the line that it's, it's going to be open in a few months. We need this money to open it and blah, blah, blah. So they wanted $35,000. I gave them, I think, $5,000 in the car ride. And then I get out of the car and I had prepaid for like three months of living in the Fort Harrison Hotel. And I think I was like $1,000 short. And there was a, a representative for the hotel who was standing, who opened, literally opened the door for me. It was like, where's the thousand bucks? You know, so I gave him a thousand dollars cash, and then an hour later, I'm in Dave Foster's office getting reg for my entire bridge, which is like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I mean, and this and this never stopped though, Mark. I mean, this this was like you know, basically from the day I got there to the day I left, there were seven people asking me for money the whole time, every day, nonstop.